part of rearranging our worship service is actually to uh, be able to live stream more of our service. We sometimes, from time to time, have done that for just the sermon. Um, but we wanted to start that now. So anybody who's watching, so it's now on. Um, anyone who's watching on video, welcome. We're really glad that you're able to participate no, in the service in this way. Um, and uh, so we'll Sorry, move into the remainder of our service uh, with our prayer of confession. Let us pray. Holy God, we come before you acknowledging that we are broken people. Um, we are at times uncertain, uh, anxious, and we acknowledge that it's hard to celebrate when we are anxious. It can be hard to put your kingdom first when we are concerned for safety and health. It can be hard to put others first when we are wrapped up in our own needs and desires. And yet you call us to do these things. We acknowledge those times when we have fallen short of your call to action and to grace in our lives. Oh God, we trust in you and in your forgiveness. We ask now for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Friends, the good news is that God came into this world in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, he lived among us. He taught us the right way to live. He laid down his life for us. He died for our sin, and he did not have power over us anymore. More than this, Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen, and we can be assured of new life in him that we can receive even now. Know today that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. Amen. Uh, we are going to uh, go over a few community announcements. Um, we are uh, we're not taking up an offering today. One of the things that we were trying to do today was to try to limit the number of people that were obligated to volunteer this morning. Um, and so part of that was, um, uh, was not doing our offering. Uh, one of the things we've been working on actually for a couple of months already is a better way of doing an online giving. Um, and uh, so we're not quite ready for that, but, uh, but that'll be coming really soon. Uh, and that's not a response to the current uh, COVID-19 worry. We've actually started working on that in January. So um, we're just getting to the point of being able to, to have that ready and we'll maybe speed it up a little bit uh, based, on, based on the current reality. Um, and uh, I know there's lots of uncertainty about um, how public gatherings and what's going to happen with that uh, and uh, what will happen for churches in particular. Many churches have uh, chosen to not have their worship services today, and we hold those uh, communities in our prayers um, for those uh, choices. Uh, being a small church, it was a little bit easier to, to be okay with gathering together. I know uh, ministers of large churches have pretty much had to say that they can't uh, gather in a large community. Um, next week, we have our annual general meeting. Uh, I'm going to consult with our elders this week and just find out exactly what we want to do with that, whether we're proceeding or how, or whether we can make a video option available or, or what. So just stay tuned. Uh, there'll be information that'll go out in the email. That email is now becoming quite important about getting those announcements out. So, uh, and then we'll try to cover those who are not on that list by phone, uh, if necessary, for that meeting. Um, but uh, if you don't hear anything, let's assume that there's church next week and that the meeting is happening next week. Um, uh, and, and, but we'll try our best to communicate throughout the week. Uh, just about the AGM, um, we have, uh, there's a, an announcement in the program or you can find throughout the emails as well. Uh, we are going to, the hope is to have a conversation about the stewardship of the McGilvery property. And, um, and so, uh, there's a document available through the email um, or also I printed a few copies to have at the back if you want that on paper you can take that. Um, I also keep saying through the email but we did post on our website prairiechurch.ca we just posted um, uh, if you scroll down a little bit on that website you can find the email just by clicking on it so if, you don't, if you're not subscribed to that you can just go to prairiechurch.ca and find it. Um, but we'll have a conversation about that so I'm not going to go over that document today, but I'll do that next week, uh, either in the service or in the context of the meeting next week. Um, I think that's about all I wanted. Oh, no, there's one more thing, sorry. We did print these programs before we uh, had some information. We, we were hoping to have a discussion with Alison Carr, you'll see on the, on the program, uh, that we were going to have a time when she's here from Toronto uh, for 
for some meetings. Uh, those meetings ended up being cancelled, so she's no longer coming here. So we're actually not filming. We, have, we were announcing today that we were going to have an event. We're now announcing that the event that we hadn't already announced is now cancelled. So it's, uh, but just don't get confused that the programs were printed before we had an opportunity to let you know about that. So Jenna's going to lead us through some time of prayer. Welcome, thanks for joining us online, and I'm so glad to see so many people here today. Let, uh, let us pray. Uh, just so I, I wanted to let you know actually about this prayer. I found this from the Presbyterian Church in Canada's uh, worship resources. Uh, it's the third week of Lent prayer, and it was actually written a long time ago, but as I was reading through it, it felt very fitting. Um, and so we're gonna also end with the Lord's Prayer, and feel free to speak that in whatever version is comfortable and familiar to you. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for the many ways you make yourself known to us. In Jesus Christ, you provide a stream of living water that nourishes the roots of our faith and refreshes us with hope. Through your Holy Spirit, you surprise us with insight and inspire us with purpose and courage to follow your paths. We are grateful, grateful for your faithfulness to us through all life's ups and downs. As a river gradually carves its way through rock to fulfill its purposes, continue your spirit's gentle, persuasive work in us. Deepen our sense of your presence with us each day and renew us with wisdom and truth that we too may fulfill your purposes. Faithful God, hear us now as we bring before you the people and places on our hearts today. We pray for those we love, asking that your goodness may flourish in their lives. Deepen their joy and empower them to live your truth with the guidance of your spirit. We pray for all those who are in need of your healing and love, especially for people who are ill, unemployed, overworked, lonely, or frightened. Touch their deepest needs with your loving kindness and bring them the support they need the most. We pray for those who serve in leadership roles in government, business, and public institutions. May all who lead be blessed with the gifts of wisdom and compassion. Bring peace to the troubled places in this world. Hear us as we pray for areas and situations in news this past week. And we pray for ourselves, asking you to heal the hurts and strengthen the hope we carry this day. May we live your truth boldly in the week ahead. Let your spirit be reflected in our actions as we seek to follow Jesus, who taught us to pray together. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So our scripture reading today comes from Matthew, chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they, could not, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat cows have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves maltreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets, and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets, and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe, and he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. 
Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'll invite Matt up. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for your servant, Matt. We thank you for the wisdom that you are speaking through him. Open our hearts and ears to hear your word in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, Jesus, whoa, that's really loud. There we go. Can you turn that down a little bit? That'd be great. Okay. Uh, Jesus uh, ends his parable that we're looking at today um, with uh, with this phrase: "Many are called, but few are chosen." And it's actually, a, I think, kind of a complicated phrase that Jesus says. Like, we're, what does that really mean? Many are called, but few are chosen. Um, and I actually think we need a different, slightly different way of thinking about this particular phrase in order to get into it. Um, if you look at the actual sentence in Greek, I don't know Greek, I'll just put that out there, but I trust experts who have done this and and try to piece things together from what they say. Uh, this, uh, many are called, but few are chosen. Uh, you, you can also read it kind of like this. Many are invited, but few are pure, or few are choice. As in like, if you went to a, a restaurant and you said, I want the choice piece of meat. <laughs> That's the one I'm gonna choose, right? Um, many are invited, but few are choice are chosen. Uh, I think we actually might need to move from, uh, we often have sort of categorical or noun kind of thinking, like we think in noun, we need to actually think that way, um, as opposed to agency or verb thinking. So when we hear things like uh, called and chosen, we are automatically thinking of those as verbs, right? So we're automatically thinking, well, God is calling people and God is choosing people. But I actually think the Greek way of thinking about this might actually be less about verbs. That would be a Hebrew way of thinking, but this was written in Greek. A Greek way of thinking would be in nouns or categories, as in the called ones or the chosen ones. So when we hear called and chosen, we're actually thinking about the nouns of the people who are those things, rather than an action that God is taking on us. So that thinking is actually quite important to understand. Um, we can then also think a little bit about what happens in the story that Jesus tells that seems to cause a difference between those who are called and those who are chosen. Actually, it seems like the called is a larger group, and then out of that group, there are some chosen ones. And what actually creates that? Because it seems in the parable that what causes the chosenness is actually the response of the ones who are chosen, which seems a little odd. So, is it that just God picks people out and they're chosen? Or is it that someone responds in a certain way to the call of God, and then they become the chosen ones because they have responded in a certain way? Because it seems like entering the banquet fully, this uh, story is about a banquet that people come to, entering the banquet fully and putting on a robe, like not being caught without the banquet robe on, that seems to be what causes the chosen to be in that category. Uh, there is massive grace in this parable that we might miss because there's also quite a bit of what seems like some terrible judgment in this parable, but there's actually a ton of grace in the invitation in this parable. And yes, there is righteousness or judgment toward our responses or the responses that are in this parable. Now, it's quite important as well, as we get into this story, that um, Jesus is actually telling a series of stories and sayings, and as he's telling those stories, the Pharisees and scribes who are listening in amongst the crowd are getting angrier and angrier. And this really puts them over the edge. At the end of this parable, they basically decide, mm, okay, let's figure out a plot to how we can arrest this guy. So... That's, this is the parable that leads to that, in Matthew's telling of the story. So they're, they're pretty upset. 
Now, what will be ringing in the Pharisees' ear and the scribes' ears, and probably most of the listeners' ears, but it'd be really poignant for the Pharisees, is that when Jesus starts throwing around these words like called and chosen, they, they, they believe they are the chosen people. They are the, the chosen people of God. And the only thing that can make you unchosen is breaking the law, breaking God's law in some way. It could set you outside of the chosen people and it was a system to re-enter in. And guess what? They are essentially the arbiters of that system. So they control the system and they're also committed to upholding it. So they're committed to living a pure life and trying not to break any of the laws. But they also seem to get a lot of say as to, well, who can be in and who can be out. And, uh, and they are pretty much in control of that. And Jesus shows up and just starts to talk to people and say, actually, none of that. There's actually this great invitation that goes out everywhere that's wide open. But it seems like only a few end up chosen because you actually have closed yourselves off to that wide open invitation. You don't want to accept that. You want to retain your control of the system. You want to decide who's in and who's out. But that's not the way it works with God. God's doing something else. Because guess what? It's not the people out there who are refusing it. He says to the Pharisees. He says, it's you. You good, religious, upstanding people are the ones who are missing the great invitation. The people out there that you say has nothing to do with church or, uh, or purity or getting it right, they're the ones who are accepting this invitation. Um, the, the story right before the one we are looking at today is, uh, so if you look at Matthew 21, verses 33 to 45, it says, listen to... Uh, Jesus saying, listen to another parable. So here's another parable to help clarify and explain the, the one parable we're going to look at. Get the irony there. Um, there was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it, okay? Uh, dug a wine press in it and then built a watchtower. He then leased it to tenants and this landowner went to another country. So he's leased it out to tenants. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves or his servants to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Whether he died or not, we don't know from the story. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir, come, let's kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will put those wretches to a miserable death, and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. And then Jesus' conclusion is, Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you. He's really pointed and direct. He doesn't say, he doesn't use veiled language here. He's talking directly to the Pharisees. The, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. And then we get in verse 45 of this chapter, this is just before our parable, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, they realized that he was speaking about them. And they wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. But he tells one more parable that pushes them over the edge, and then they figure out how to do it anyway. I mean, that's basically what happens. Now, why does Jesus, after this, which is a real indictment against the system and the Pharisees, right? Why does he then go and tell another story, our story, to illustrate, once again, the loss of the kingdom for those who reject him? Like, that seems to be what this, what both of these parables seem to be about, Right? Why not just conclude with something like this? So look, lots of people are invited to the kingdom. It's a wide invitation. But the response to that wide invitation matters. You won't be part of the chosen people without that response. Why doesn't he just conclude with that? Why tell another story? And I think 
He tells a story because the conclusion that I just gave actually is too simple, um, in true Jesus fashion. It isn't just an equation, and we see this happening all the time in the religious life as we search for an equation that we can just plug ourselves into. So it isn't just an equation that we can then just apply to our lives. It isn't really true that if you, if you just respond the right way, uh, that means you're chosen. But that's not really quite the whole story. And we are tempted to make that the whole story, and yet we have this whole real story, like the true story, the Bible. If it was that simple, we would have just had like, you know, a paragraph, right? It's not. It's beautiful and meaningful and deep, and it's bigger than all of that. It isn't really true that you can just respond the right way, and then that makes you chosen. See, because when we make that move, when we try to just simplify it into that kind of equation, you know what we've ended up doing is we've, we've placed the emphasis way too much on just our response and not at all on the persistent call and invitation of God. We've actually missed out when we do that, that the primary character and the primary actor in all of this is actually God and not us. And we're really good at reducing the Bible and the story of Jesus down to a story about me rather than a story about God, right? Um, so let's take a look at this, um, this passage. So Jesus tells a story, and I think the story itself has elements in it that are really important for our life of faith. So we shouldn't just say, well, this is really just about an equation that we can reduce ourselves down to. We should respond to Jesus' call. There's, there's way more here. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a, bank, a wedding banquet for his son. Uh, we could easily gloss over this because it's nice to think about banquets, right? And that is an amazing image of the kingdom that Jesus uses all the time, about this amazing banquet. So we can imagine great food and celebration. But we also can miss in this that it's not just any banquet, it's a wedding banquet for the king's son. And, and we'll come back to this because the son is really important, but we often miss it. Because again, we probably make it about us and how we want to have all this great food at the banquet. <laughs> so anyway, the king is throwing a party, a wedding banquet for his son, and he sent his slaves or his servants to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. And again, he sent other slaves saying, tell those who have been invited, look, I've prepared my dinner and everything's ready. Come to the wedding banquet. People have already been invited. So he's not extending a new invitation here. People have already been invited. Uh, in Jesus' pointed own way of dealing with this parable, he's talking to the Jewish people, like represented by the religious elites in this case, the Pharisees and the scribes. Already been invited. That you already you could already be there. And so all he's doing with his, slave, his servants is saying, just go and call the people. Tell them that it's ready now. The people who already know they're invited, go call them. And could this be the equivalent of, say, the prophets, the Old Testament prophets, going and calling people back to God, right? You can come. And the thing is, they don't come. So they go and they get called in and invited into the banquet, and they don't come. And the king's response to this, which again we often will miss, is, well, I guess I'll try some other servants then, and, and send them out with an invitation. Like he doesn't just say, Wow, you totally missed the boat, forget it, right? He sends more servants. Say to them, look, everything's ready. It's right here for you to enjoy. Just come. So he does that, and then we get verse 5. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business. Wow, this, this verse, is I think, is really resonant for us, right? Like this... This could have been written, like, last year, um, right? It's like, Jesus could be saying this right now. The invitation comes, and they make light of it. Well, nah, it's not a big deal. Like, it doesn't matter. Or make fun of it. That's stupid. What are you even talking about? Um, I've got more important things to do, right? I've got to attend to my business. I've got to do my work. That's what happens in verse 5. In verse 6, it's a lot worse. The rest, 
So some of them made light of it, and the rest of them seized his servants, maltreated them, and killed them. So one response to the invitation is, eh, indifference, making fun of it, something's more important. And another response is violence. So are these the martyrs? Are these those who have been sent? Are these people who are under persecution today because of their faith in Christ? Whoever these people are that are being maltreated like this and killed, we know that the ones who did it, that their response to the invitation to this amazing banquet of God is a response of violence. And then verse 7, the king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. It's a terrifying thought, isn't it? If the king is representing God in this, it's a terrifying thought. But what are, what's the alternative here? A king who doesn't really care so much when someone kills his subjects, right? I actually think the king was enraged is a really good sentence. I'm, I'm a little worried about what he actually does, but the king was enraged, yeah. This beautiful banquet that's been prepared, and then this response of violence, and the king is enraged. I, I don't really want a god that just shrugs his shoulders at that and just says, oh, I guess, I guess grace and love. You know? Do we really, like, what's the alternative? Do we really want a king who has no consequences for, for the actions of the people who are under his care? Do we want that? I think we want a non-judgmental God, but the problem with that is that we end up with a God of no righteousness then, right? It's funny because we, we have the same root words in there. We actually want a God of justice, but we also want a God of no judgment. Well, that, you can't actually do that. It's the same word. Now, we don't really like his response. What we would want is a measured and proportional response, right? So, okay, you killed your servants, but really what we would like is a jail sentence so that they can be properly rehabilitated and integrated back into society, right? Like that's what would be better, right? We don't want vengeance, but we do want justice. But you see what we've done there when we do that. We've made two moves that we actually can't make when it comes to the biblical text. The first thing is what we've done is we've imposed uh, albeit a caricatured uh, understanding, but we've imposed our understanding of justice onto the text, when actually what the king does is probably fairly gracious justice in the first century, okay? So what he doesn't do is he doesn't pillage, he doesn't enslave, he doesn't cause further suffering, he doesn't go and uh, rape the women and slaughter all the children first, you know, he doesn't do any of those things. He just kills the people responsible and burns it so there's nothing left and we can have a fresh start. I mean, that sounds horrible to us, but in the first century, Jesus actually couldn't have said, oh, and then he gave them a life sentence with no parole. That didn't exist. Like, he couldn't have said that. So we can't make that move. The second move that we can't make, or that we ought not make, even though we make this second move all the time, is that what we do is we slide ourselves into the seat of judgment, okay? So we will gladly judge Jesus' parable, and we'll do it by 21st century Canadian values, no less. So we'll gladly do that, but we don't want a God of judgment, right? We don't want a God of judgment, but we're perfectly willing to make judgments ourselves, especially about how God should or shouldn't we will gladly do that. So yes, it's problematic, it's hard to read, but we have to be a little careful about how we treat the text in its historical context, and also that we don't just automatically just put ourselves over the text and say, oh, this can't be, this is no good. All right, so yeah, there's, there's some problems there. But in verse eight, he then, the king turns to 
this, he seems to have an endless supply of servants, right? So he's got to turn to his servants again. The wedding is ready, he says, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. This to me is amazing. The king persists. He, he has dealt with those murderers, and he, actually, if you look at it from the king's perspective, he suffered terrible losses in this. And then what does he do? He continues with his plan. The wedding is still on, everybody. The brokenness and the hurt of this world does not stop the celebration that the king has prepared. It doesn't stop it. He doesn't say, oh man, well, there's no way we can go ahead with the, with the wedding now. Oh, there's no way we can do this. It's too much brokenness, too much hurt. No, he persists. And he goes deeper with it. He says, okay, we got room now, so go out into the streets and just invite everybody. Just everyone. Wow. And those slaves went out in the streets, verse 10, and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. The text says, so the wedding hall was filled with guests, uh, both good and bad. I went and looked up these words to find out, like, well, what does the Greek mean when it really says bad or good? Um, well, it, the Greek means bad and good. Um, <laughs> bad uh, gave synonyms for that as an evil or wicked. Oh, well, that was really helpful looking that up. There's no nuance. And actually, when you think about this, this is a major dig at the religious elites, isn't it? Major dig at the Pharisees. Who's invited to this? Everyone? <laughs> like, bad people? <laughs> the unclean? The people who we've said actually cannot enter into the community? They're invited? The people who we disagree with? The person I hate and I've legitimized my hate, they're invited. And, and you might start to see why some are rejecting the invitation. Well, I can't be in the same room as that person. I'm sorry, they're invited. They're invited. God. And it's a Greek sentence, isn't it? Those slaves went out of the streets gathered all whom they found, both good and bad, so the wedding hall was filled with guests. We know that Jesus does not end parables when we think he's going to end them, because that should be the end, right? <laughs> it's not. So the king, when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. And then the king said to his attendants, Bind him hand and foot, throw him out into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then Jesus gives this conclusion, for many are called, but few are chosen. A little bit on the cultural context of this, right? Like what's going on? Uh, in that time, wedding guests, when they came to a wedding, actually received a gown or a wedding robe from the host of the wedding. So part of that was actually to do away with social standing at the celebration. It's actually quite a lovely thing where, you know, so if a poor person came they would get the same robe as a rich person who came, and everybody's on an equal playing field at the wedding. So this actually kind of helps us even understand the context of the kingdom of God being like a wedding banquet in a whole new way. Right? Um, so that's a, a good cultural context to know about. It's important that the robe was supplied by the host, which is usually the groom or the groom's father. So in this case, the king or the king's son. But let me just give you an example here to help us just try to visualize what's going on here, like why if someone doesn't have a robe, um, just to get the feel of it. Okay, imagine uh, you're, you've been invited to try out for a hockey team, okay? Um, let's say you've been invited to like open tryouts for the Jets, like they would never have that, but um, <laughs> let's, say, let's say they have that and, and you, you go and, uh, and you're going to try out, open tryouts for the Jets. Um, and, uh, and as you come in, everyone's handed a Jets jersey, right? Everyone's given a Jets jersey as they, as they come into the tryout. And the manager comes in, 
And he looks around at the players on the ice, and he sees someone who's wearing an Edmonton Oilers jersey. <laughs> right? And he goes up to him and he says, and what do managers say, right? Because I love this one of my favorite parts of this parable is the king comes to the guy and says, friend, <laughs> friend. Um, but the manager would come and he'd say, son, <laughs> why aren't you wearing the jerseys we handed out? And the, and the player just does this. <laughs> like, I don't know. He gives no response. Well, what does the manager do, that, do with that? Yeah, you're not making the team. <laughs> like, he kicks him out of the trial, right? But here, in the banquet of the kingdom, everyone who receives the robe puts it on, and, except for this one person, and, and it's not actually a tryout, right? Like, they all make the team. Like, everybody makes the team. All you've got to do is show up and put the robe on. You've just got to show up and put the jersey in, you're on the team. But in our story, there's one there without a robe, and, and it means actually that he came in, but he did not stand before the one who was giving out the robes to receive one, right? He, he didn't come to the groom. He didn't come to the sun. Everyone else is coming to the sun and saying, oh, great, I got my robe. But this, this one, what is he clothed in? Is he clothed in his own sense of worthiness to be there, but not the worthiness of the Son? Is he clothed in his own sense of righteousness that I deserve this, I deserve this, uh, this banquet, or I deserve these things, instead of being clothed in the righteousness of the Son? Is he standing there in his own clothes rather than the clothes of Jesus? Because even when we're in the banquet, we easily forget who the banquet is for. It's a celebration of the marriage of the king's son. Jesus is the one through whom we come to the banquet. You actually can't skip that. This man seems to have tried to figure out how to do it without Jesus, without coming and getting the robe from him. And yet God will not force the issue with us ever. The invitation is wide open, but God will not force the banquet on us. He's actually given us freedom. So in the end, there's lots in this parable about God and who he is and how we relate to him. But in the end, it's also, it is, it can be quite simple. Respond to the invitation. Receive the garment of the king and stay Turn that off. We're gonna do one more thing. Um, <laughs> I'm going to invite you to uh, stand, and uh, we're going to read together um, a section from Living Faith. So it's section 3.6, which is called Salvation in Christ. And uh, so I invite you to stand, and we'll put that up on the screen to read that together. I don't know if that can be seen. Yeah, I can make it work. Um, yeah, you do. All right, let's read this together. Salvation, Salvation comes from God's grace, grace alone. alone. Received through faith in Christ, from all eternity, and through no merit on our part. God calls us to life in Christ. Here is the good news of the gospel. Jesus Christ is the elect one, chosen for our salvation. In him we are made acceptable to God. Before the world was made, we were chosen in Christ to be part of the family of God. We are called for a purpose. We have been predestined to be like Christ and to serve God. As with Israel in the Old Testament, so with the new humanity in the New Testament, God chooses us. There is assurance in knowing that the living God has eternal purposes to achieve through us. God will bring to completion the work of grace begun in us. You can remain uh, standing because we're going to sing, so I'll invite the singers to come back.